Rubber bands are very useful things to have in your house. They're very helpful for holding things together. They have the quality of being elastic. They can stretch and contract. Elastic is very good for holding up your pants, your socks, and even your underwear. And it's the tension in the band that makes it useful. Elasticity can even be a superpower in the movie The Incredibles. The mom's superpower is that she can stretch and stretch and stretch. And I'm sure many of us can relate. But what happens when a rubber band is stretched too far? When the tension and the pressure on the band becomes greater than the band can bear? Ah! I could just sense the trepidation and the tension as you waited for the moment when the band might snap. Well, many people live with that constant taste of state of tension and they are stretched so thin by their circumstances that all that's possible is simply dealing with the next need or crisis. How will you put the next meal on the table or pay the next bill? How will they survive the next time they're kicked or abused? How they'll manage to resist the craving for the drug that makes all the pain and shame go away? And when we are that thinly stretched, almost at our limits, the danger of snapping is always close at hand. We end up living in survival mode and it's hard to look beyond ourselves. Some of us may just lose hope and others become aggressive and grasping. And tragically, some may be driven to do desperate things in order to get what they need. But what if there was a way for that tension to be eased, for the rubber band to not be so tightly stretched? What if there was a way to get relief, to ease up the tension? That's where mercy comes in. I was very struck one time when Craig Welch, the CEO of Portsmouth Housing Authority, spoke about the effect of the work we do as a church at Gosling Meadows. For a number of years, a team of people has provided a community meal every Thursday, a kids club on a Saturday morning, as well as running fun evenings for residents on national nights out. Welch made the comment that those consistent acts of kindness create slack for people, easing the tension. Providing just one meal can make a tight budget go further and the Kids Club provides a healthy and safe place for children to have fun. That phrase, cut me some slack, takes on a new meaning when I remember his comments. In fact, I remember one prayer meeting when we were praying for what we do at Gosling, where I sensed God say to me that small acts of kindness can alter the trajectory of someone's life. I saw a picture of an arrow pointing forward, representing the path and direction of someone's life, and saw how over time, just one degree turns, representing words and deeds of mercy, have the power to alter the trajectory and direction for good, lifting people up. And isn't that just like our God? He lifts people up. Psalm 113 says, Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes with the princes of his people. The reference to dust and ash heap makes me think of the broken and burnt parts of people's lives, poverty and disease, sin and brokenness. And those things manifest themselves in many ways, homelessness, addiction, bankruptcy, loneliness, anxiety and depression, which are ultimately the result of broken relationships and isolation. But God raises us from the dust and the ash heap. And because we are the visible body of Christ on the earth, called to be his hands and feet, he wants to work through us to raise people up. So practically speaking, what might this look like? How might we work with the Holy Spirit and have the joy of seeing him raise people up, changing the trajectory of people's lives? Well, a good starting point is to have an understanding of how poverty affects all of us. In a recent blog on the World Vision website, Samson Okolo makes the point that poverty is a complex issue, saying, the complexity of poverty may surprise you. Poverty is not just about money, but also includes issues of access to services, such as healthcare, education, marginalization, and exclusion. Essentially, poverty refers to lacking enough resources to provide the necessities of life, like food, shelter and clothing, but in today's world that can be extended to include access to healthcare, education and even transportation. That's a wide range of issues and as Ian reminded us recently, 
If we're going to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom as Jesus did, then it means ministering to the whole person in both word and deed. He reminded us that it's more than just winning souls to Christ. It means more than just being concerned with people's spiritual well-being. It's also working for the physical, psychological and social well-being of people, as well as families and communities. It's about working to relieve suffering and remove injustice. Because in God's kingdom, all things are to come under the Lordship of Christ. All things are being redeemed by him. And that means all of life and creation, both the material and the immaterial, both our spirits and our bodies. Wow! The whole person. Physical, psychological, social and spiritual. It's about food, housing and clothing. About jobs, identity, dignity and purpose. It's about welcoming people into community. So raising someone up is about the immediate relief of physical needs on the one hand, but it's also about the restoration of relationships. Helping people to love themselves, to love others and to love God. And how we go about this is really important, but one thing I know for sure is that with the help of the Holy Spirit, the trajectory is always up. When offering any kind of help, first we need to look up. Before we even begin, we have to know that Jesus is the rescuer, not us. He's already working before we even get there. We simply get to work with him. The Psalm says that it's God who looks down from on high. We don't look down on anyone because we too were once sitting in dust and ashes. So therefore we own up to our own brokenness. We remember our story, how God raised us up. Because when we remember that we too received mercy, it makes us humble and soft-hearted, grateful for the grace of God in our lives. Because a judgmental or superior attitude will kill a relationship like nothing else. Because it makes you an unsafe person. And though someone might take the stuff that you offer, they won't trust you. And trust is crucial if we're going to see relationships restored. The right attitude is crucial, but so are good deeds because they cheer up. Never underestimate the value of simple kindnesses. One person's good deed can be another person's miracle. So practice acts of kindness that meet a need or put a smile on someone's face because it means that you remember them and that you care enough to show it. But if you're going to give a gift, make sure it is appropriate and not overly extravagant. We don't want people to feel beholden to us. And we need to be certain that there are no hidden strings attached. We don't do good deeds and expect something in return, like attendance at meetings. Saying that, we love to send cards and gifts to the ladies at Lydia's House of Hope and New Generation. But those gifts are an expression of our relationship. So let's cheer up. And let's lift up. Galatians asks us to carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. But a few verses later, it says that each one should carry their own load. So which is it? Well, it's both, depending on the situation. When we lift someone up, we carry them for a while, doing for them things that normally we would expect them to do for themselves. And that kind of relief is usually immediate and for the short term for a specific need. Like cooking for someone who's just undergone surgery helping with bills for someone who just lost their job, paying for emergency accommodation for someone who's left a dangerous situation to ensure their immediate safety. Lifting someone up means that we help to carry their load until they are able to shoulder the weight themselves. And providing this kind of relief often involves some kind of financial help. And at times that's the right thing to do. There are definitely times when money is the answer and we pay up. When is that a good idea? Well, when we can't go and that the money is needed to offer relief, like the safe house situation, we couldn't go ourselves, but it was entirely appropriate to send money to buy plane tickets so that those women could fly to freedom. It's also appropriate to pay up when there's no other resource available and the need is immediate. Maud and Brian are often in this situation with benevolence, providing immediate relief in tough situations. But oftentimes, splashing cash is the easy way out, and it's not the best answer. By paying for something like an electric bill or simply rent, we may be simply kicking the can down the road. 
It depends whether that need is a one-off or a pattern of repeats. Because when we're providing physical relief, like financial help, our ultimate goal must be to see somebody become self-sufficient and enable them to carry their own load. Many times what's needed is not a hand out, but a hand up, where we stretch out our hand to lift somebody up onto their own two feet and to help them get moving. Let's take a look at transportation, which the World Vision quote mentioned. Without transport, you're dependent on others for rides. How do you get to work, attend important appointments, drop off children at daycare and run family errands? especially if you live in an area where the public transport is limited. Transportation is a key resource for someone who is seeking to climb out of poverty. You need a job to earn money, but how do you get to your job without transport? And how do you get the money to buy a car without a job? Hmm. That's what inspired us to start Vroom Vroom Beep Beep, which is a matching fund that supports people on their recovery journey by helping them to purchase a car. But it is a partnership. We work with someone who is known to us, usually through our Act 2 programme. Our goal is to see families in safe and reliable cars that help them in their journey to becoming self-sufficient. They're already saving for a car and we simply match their savings with a financial award designed to give an assist but not take over. It's a reward for hard work and so far we've helped three people to get on the road and seen the positive effect that has on restoring relationships. Our very first recipient wrote to us, I just want to take the time to say how grateful I am. This award doesn't only change my life, but will also change the life of my two children and my mother. My consistency of being absent in their lives will now be filled with the joys of being present. I want to thank God and everyone who continued to believe in me when I couldn't see it through to believe in myself. Someone else wrote, I appreciate that you recognise people in recovery who have worked their butt off to change their life. It was definitely a long, bumpy, curvy road and I've been walking on foot humbly. But because you guys at New Frontiers Church care and you're willing to help, I'm now able to take that next step. This is just so wonderful. I can start a new job and a new life. I'm excited to get up in the morning to go to work. Because you invested in me to see me reach my goals, my employer will be investing in me so I get the education and license I need to pursue nursing. God bless you all and thanks again for this blessing. It has launched me into a more hopeful future where I'm set up for success and I can keep growing. Wonderful! And here she is in her new car. So a hand up usually involves working with someone to support their goals rather than doing something for them. It's a good principle that we never do for someone what they're capable of doing for themselves because that creates dependency. But we can walk alongside and give an assist. We can help them to access existing resources. And for self-sufficiency, supporting someone as they get back into education or the workforce is often key. That may involve helping someone write a resume or do some interview practice. And I love the fact that we have the rack where women in transition can shop for gently loved clothing, for interviews, for court dates, for work and for everyday life. Something as practical as a suitable outfit restores confidence and boosts self-esteem. It also equips someone with what they need to re-enter the workforce and therefore start to carry their own load. When it comes to offering a hand up, rather than paying up and spending money, it's a call to spend yourself. That's much more costly than writing a cheque. It involves spending time and energy building a relationship of trust in order to work with someone. And it may be costly, but oh, the joy of seeing God transform a life. And he sustains us as we go. Isaiah 58 says, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. God helps us to raise people up. And because we're seeking to restore relationships, as well as offering relief, our approach should be relational wherever possible. And a huge part of that simply involves showing up. 
week after week, month after month, year after year, like at Gosling, demonstrating consistency, integrity. It takes time to build a trusting relationship, especially when someone's been abandoned and put down many times. And as we spend time, it's so important to listen up, to take the time to listen to someone's story and identify the real need. Oftentimes you will be surprised. And when we do speak in a world which is so broken and negative, we can use our words to build up rather than put down. I love Ephesians 4.29. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what's helpful for building others up according to their needs that it might benefit those who listen. A word of encouragement and the knowledge that someone believes in you can go a long way to restoring someone's confidence and belief in themselves. Words are important. And there are times when we need to use our words to speak up on behalf of others. For example, when we see injustice and the person suffering has no voice or where we can make a significant difference because of our expertise or our influence. Just last year, Michelle decided to follow Jesus and she got fully involved in our Act 2 programme, baptised and is now a beloved member of our family. She knew that her past was forgiven, but some of those past events meant that she had broken the terms of her housing lease and she was served an eviction notice. Legitimately, but it seemed so harsh given all the progress she'd made in putting her life back together. Losing her accommodation could have jeopardised everything she worked for. She decided to appeal to housing and set up a meeting with Craig Welch. She asked me and her recovery coach to also attend the meeting and speak on her behalf. Well, during that meeting, Michelle spoke up for herself and we endorsed her report on the progress she'd made. And then we literally asked housing, please, will you show mercy? Rather than making an example of Michelle, would you allow her to be an example to others would you give her this a second chance to prove that she's turned her life around? Well, when we left the meeting, I had no idea what would happen. But Craig Wells decided to take a risk on Michelle and cut her some slack. Michelle will tell you that it meant a lot to her when he trusted her, even when she didn't necessarily trust herself. After that meeting, for the first time, she went home and fell to her knees before God in thanksgiving. Craig did put her on probation for a year and Michelle wrote to him every month to tell him how she was doing and she's doing great. Just two weeks ago, Michelle was in a meeting with Craig Welsh and he graduated her. And When I called to thank him for giving her a second chance, he said she was worth the risk. I'm telling this story with his permission because we acknowledge during our conversation how we really appreciate working together when it's appropriate. And that brings me to a really important point. When we are working to raise people up, it is so beneficial to team up and to work with other community agencies that are doing a good job. You see, we don't have all the answers. And when we work together and we honour the work of other agencies, we have access to more resources. But just as importantly, we are modelling healthy community relationships to those we are seeking to serve. We are so grateful for our good work and relationships with Portsmouth Housing, with Welfare, Safe Harbour and others. And we love to work with and support Chase Home and our friends at Lydia's House of Hope and New Generation. It's been a total joy to get to know those ladies and watch God raise them up. Recently, we had the privilege of baptising two of them and welcoming them and others into our church family. Fantastic. So in summary, recognise that God is the one who raises people up. In humility, do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Cheer up, lift up, pay up and offer a hand up. Build and model healthy relationships by showing up again and again. And while you're there, resolve to listen up and to build up. And make the most of every opportunity you get to speak up on somebody's behalf and strengthen your impact by teaming up with others. But finally, as you do that, always point up. When someone compliments you and says how great you are for helping out, point to Jesus and his work of grace in your life. Because as we said at the beginning, Jesus is the rescuer. Jesus' death and resurrection made it possible for all of us to be reconciled to God. He raises people up. 
He raises the poor from the dust and the needy from the ash heap. He forgives our sins and heals our brokenness. He restores our relationships. When we experience his grace and kindness, we love him, we learn to love others, and maybe more importantly, we learn to love ourselves. If you're listening to this today and you feel tightly stretched, like that rubber band, and you don't know how you'll cope, please get in touch. We are here to listen, and maybe we can help. God bless your day, everybody. Mm -hmm.